Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lin. I'm a project naval architect in the Surface Ship Design and Systems Engineering Division of NAFSI's Engineering Directorate, commonly known as O5D. Glenn Sturdivant, my co-chair, is the Chief Technology Officer for NAFSI's team ships. And on behalf of Glenn and the rest of the planning committee, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the first session of the Women in Naval Engineering track. What I'd like to do first is to start the session by showing a short two-minute video that will help frame the reason for why we're here. Even as a young child, I had a tendency to uh, take things apart and try to figure out how they worked and attempt to put them back together. So I was encouraged by my family from a young age to go into engineering. The most exciting thing about my job now is that I am working on projects that are being made now. It was amazing going out for the first time and being able to walk around the ship and identify certain things that I had helped add to the ship. Everything is just so new and fresh and everybody seems so excited about what they're doing and it makes you want to be excited about what you're doing. It's always both challenging and exciting, mostly because you're working on things that will have an impact and products that real people will be using. And I hope that someday uh, I'll be able to see a ship in the fleet and know that I've played a part in its design. What I want to get out of my profession is to uh, is to be able to bring in the next generation of engineers. Women are still seriously underrepresented in engineering and I think it's important that our perspective is included. So I think girls should go into it. They're very clever, they're very clever with the math and details. And we're missing out by not having a lot more women in it. You can come from whatever background, you can, it doesn't matter what gender you are. If you want to do something and, and you have the the uh, commitment and the dedication, then you can. And science, technology, math, I mean, we literally rule the world. So the intent for our track is threefold. We want to inform the community and bring situational awareness to the lack of women in our industry. We also want to educate our attendees on the general biases and challenges we face so we can all intellectually speak about this issue. Lastly, we want to enable our community to adapt to the change in workforce demographics. Following the keynote speech on a short break, <coughs> excuse me, a short break, we will go straight into the second part of the first session, the, general, the generational lessons learned panel discussion on barriers and challenges provides experts, mid-career, and young professionals the opportunity to inform the audience about barriers and challenges, both common and unique to their generations. Later today, the Fact First Fiction Workshop will provide an opportunity to educate symposium attendees about the current workforce demographics and will also cover general workforce biases and offer tool sets to help us achieve a culture of excellence. Tomorrow morning will be the last session, reviewing the current state of research on recruitment and retention research by representatives from academia, government, and private industry. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Robin White to the podium to introduce our keynote speaker. Ms. White is the director for the Surface Ship, System, Surface Ship Design and Systems Engineering Division in NAVSI's Engineering Directorate. Good morning. Um, something very exciting happened already this morning, something that I have not had happen to me at ESNI before, and that was a line in the women's restroom. From <laughs> 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 so I think that's, that's uh, awesome. I think that's pretty amazing. That's <laughs> so um, I wanted to take just a minute to introduce Miss Allison Stiller um, and make sure she has as much time as possible to speak. 
But uh, so Allison graduated from the University of Virginia. She also has a master's in um, engineering management from Virginia Tech, a degree that I also hold. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, Allison came to the, uh, the Navy after some time in industry, the very same year that I did as well, after some time in industry. So it was kind of fun going through um, and uh, preparing for this because, because of, those, uh, of those things we have in common. But she has a broad background. Um, she's worked on submarines. She's worked on surface ships. She's worked um, as a deputy program manager. She's worked at, in a um, functional area as a, as a branch head for mechanical systems. Um, and it's all, it all culminated in her current position uh, in 2004 as the, the De Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Ship Programs. Um, it's a pretty incredible role. Um, she's become an expert in it, I think, and, we, uh, and um, in this capacity, she's responsible for the executive oversight of all naval shipbuilding programs, major ship conversions, nuclear refuelings, maintenance, modernization, and disposal of in-service ships. So this is a huge scope, and, uh, and she sees what's happening on that stage every day, and I think that's a pretty fascinating thing. So with that, I would like to introduce Ms. Allison Stiller. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Okay, I'm not computer savvy. Can I close the screen? Okay. <laughs> If I break it, I apologize. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robin, for the kind introduction. And it's, it's always interesting to know when you have parallels with someone. So we'll compare notes later on, on our journeys. I'm very excited to be with you today. And I'm, and I'm glad that ASNI's hosting this track. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for, to highlight the contributions that women make in engineering. And I believe this can be a very powerful networking opportunity for everyone here. To the men in the room, thank you for being here as well. Throughout, yes, that's <laughs> worthy of applause. Throughout my career, I've never felt like I've been advantaged or disadvantaged because I'm a woman. And I've found that the best teams are those that bring diverse ideas to bear to solve the hard technical problems. I think you're going to find today that my remarks apply equally to men and women, and engineers and non-engineers. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to ASNI on a number of occasions over the last several years. I've served as moderator on panels, and I've served as members, uh, member on a panel, usually in the shipbuilding area. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. During the panel discussions, I'm usually not totally paying full attention to my panel mates, mainly because I work with them every single day, and I know the issues, and I know what they're going to talk about. So I tend to sit, stand or sit up on the, like Robin here, sit and look at the audience, take note of who's in the audience. Um, sometimes, uh, for fun, I'll sit and count the number of men wearing red ties in the room. <laughs> I've been known to try to count the number of people wearing eyeglasses. That usually goes up pretty quick. But I always count the number of women in the room. And over the last several years, I've never been able to get above a dozen. And when I look across the crowd, I usually know most of the dozen. So I just want to say today, it's refreshing. I am not even going to try to count um, a great number of women in the audience. And I will note uh, several red ties. Um, so, uh, I did debate about accepting this invitation, and Ms. Sandell com, um, really talked me into it. I, it's not that I don't believe in ASNI, because I absolutely do, and, uh, I, and it's not because I don't want to interface and talk with all of you. It's because it's pretty uncomfortable standing up and talking about yourself and your experiences. So, I'm going to try to keep that part to a minimum. Uh, but what I will do is impart my advice, which you can you can discount or you can accept if you if you desire so there are three themes that I wanted to talk about this morning and that's ensuring that your job has purpose broadening your horizons and making your own choices um, like in the video I always knew I wanted to be an engineer I love and continue to love math and science I was a curious child and loved loved helping my dad uh, who is a mechanical engineer with his home repair projects, whether it be electrical wiring, plumbing, carpentry, you name it. 
But I admit, after taking electrical engineering in college, I no longer do dabble in electrical wiring at home. <laughs> that I pay a professional to do. So, but I decided that's what en engineering was what I wanted to do. So I applied to the University of Virginia, and when I was accepted, I never looked back. I majored in systems engineering, which during my tenure at the university was affectionately known as girls engineering. There were, out of the class of 80 or so systems engineers, 60 of us were women. And I look back on that, and in talking with a lot of my female colleagues from, from college, we believe we were drawn to systems engineering because, in fact, it's really multitasking, which I believe we do well. So when I graduated from college, as Robin noted, I was hired by a defense contractor, and I worked on the Trident submarine program. It was fascinating work and my first exposure to the Navy. I loved it. I moved around within my company, supporting many aspects of that program. In 1989, when um, NAVC began hiring engineers after a hiatus of a number of years, I jumped at the chance. I wanted to be sitting at the table with a voice at the table making decisions instead of sitting behind someone supporting them, not knowing whether they were going to speak up or not. So that's why I jumped at the chance, and I, and I was hired into the Seawolf Submarine Program Office in the Combat Systems Group. But I had all the mechanical systems related to, that, to the combat system. So think torpedo tubes, countermeasure launchers, um, weapon shipping systems, tow ray handling systems. So all the double E's in the office had no idea what I did, and quite frankly, I had no idea what they did. But Seawolf was in its infancy, and it was introducing cutting edge technology. It was a great, great place for a junior engineer to work. And I just knew I was making a difference. But my wake up call was when I was at a design review with the senior chief who worked for me. After several hours of reviewing count the countermeasure launcher design, he stood up and asked for the lead engineer to stand up and be recognized. Now I don't remember his name, but this junior engineer from Newport News Shipbuilding stood up, introduced himself, and the senior chief said, well, Joe Smith, we're going to engrave your name on a label plate right beside the launcher. And the young engineer proudly said, oh, well, that, that's just wonderful. Well, why are we going to do that? And he said, the senior chief said, so that every sailor that serves on this submarine can curse you by name. <laughs> he said, this is the most complex design I've ever seen. Can't you make this simpler? And that was an aha moment for me. <laughs> like, we have to think about who we're designing our systems for. We're designing them for our, our sailors. And we need to make sure we think about them in everything that we do. I will tell you, we simplified that design considerably. <laughs> so that's the warfighter focus has focused me and has guided me in the job choices I've made because I've always wanted to be working on product for the warfighter. Um, and I've testified before Congress a number of times, and that can be a pretty stressful experience, but I know it's important when you're sitting at the table to inform the Congress of how we're spending our taxpayer dollars and how we are providing the best ships and the best systems that we can for our warfighters. So I would, I would uh, challenge you to seek out jobs that give you a sense of purpose. And if the war, serving the warfighter is that, then continue to seek those jobs. But also remember as you go through your career to broaden your horizons. There are so many opportunities out there that you should take advantage of it when it makes sense to you. There are great developmental programs like the Engineer and Training, Industrial College of the Armed Forces, NAVC's Commander's Executive Fellowship Program recently uh, kicked off again, and there are lots of industry-sponsored developmental programs. Look into them, research them, and the best way I've found is to talk to people that have been through them and understand their experiences and see if that would apply to you. Um, sometimes rotational opportunities will just present themselves. Avail yourselves of them. Um, I was fortunate to be um, selected into the NAVC Commander's Development Program a number of years ago. And I was able to take jobs within Navy and within DOD and rotate around. But I also was able to work for the Department of Transportation for a stint and on a personal staff of a United States Senator. 
I learned so much in all of those jobs. I made so many friends along the way that I continue to keep in touch with those folks. Uh, the Senate staff in particular was a fascinating opportunity for me. Um, one issue that I was assigned to while I was on, on that staff was to represent a vendor from that state about a product that NAVC had technically um, rejected. So I found myself in a very unique position here. NAVC is paying my salary, but I'm working for the senator, and I have to figure out how tactfully to craft this letter back to NAVC that explains why they're wrong. Um, <laughs> so it was a very awkward position, but I was very fortunate to, to have a senator recognize the position he was putting me in, and so be very careful not so they would not trace back to me. But that was my first real understanding of how politics plays a role in everything we do. And so that's important to understand because that's where we get our money and our funding to buy what we buy for our warfighters. Uh, I also recommend you listen to your mentors. They'll, they may nudge you towards a job that you aren't interested in at all. And it may not be your dream job, but it may turn out to be the most rewarding, challenging job of your career. Flexibility is also key, um, and that's not always easy as an engineer. We're not usually in that comfort zone of flexibility. But I would also note that when you broaden your horizons, one way of doing that is networking. Um, it, don't think of networking as a chore. It's a wonderful way to learn about opportunities and to share experiences with colleagues. So I encourage all of you today to introduce yourselves to two or three people in the room that you don't know and get to know each other. I'm sure you'll find that you have common, common interests and you just never know when you might find yourself needing to talk to somebody that is an expert and you can say, hey, hey I talked to her or him at ASNI Day and I'm just going to give them a call or send them a note. Um, I think you'll find that that is incredibly valuable. Uh, also seek out mentors. Um, sometimes you just want somebody to validate what you're thinking, where you think you're headed in your career. But don't expect them to chart out your future for you. That is your responsibility. So mentors can be very powerful. They can be equal. They can be senior to you. Um, but seek them out. And this brings my last, to me, me to my last theme, which is choices. And you have to make the choices that are best for you. Your work should not define you. You have friends and family that help you find the right balance, rely on them. Take time for yourself. Explore your other interests. Take classes that have nothing to do with your job or your career if that's what you want to do. Join ASNI, join SWEET, join a book club, join a gym, which I should take my own advice. <laughs> and most importantly, take time off. Uh, when I was a GS-15, uh, some of you in the room will know this, I used to make it a point to take one week a quarter and go somewhere fun. Well, as you get further along in your career, you can't do that, but um, I do make the time, and if it makes sense for me to take a 15-day vacation, makes sense to me, then I do so. You know, bosses will grumble, but they'll get over it and just make sure you, know, you have a good support structure that'll cover while you're gone, because you're gonna come back refreshed and recharged. So it's very important to take time for yourself. So I'll wrap this up and then take some questions from you, but I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to have been uh, asked to come and speak to you all today, and uh, I just, uh, just want to reiterate the three themes. Find purpose in what you do. Don't stifle your curiosity. Uh, choices need to be tailored for you, but, n but don't restrict yourself and continue to broaden your horizons. So. Thanks to everyone that organized this track. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, and I welcome your questions. <laughs> Ms. Sandale. I don't think I know the answer to this question, so I'm going to ask her on the spot, but I've always wondered, when you decided to make that change from engineering and in NASA headquarters to go into acquisition more specifically, you still needed an engineering to understand the acquisition circumstances, but did you find that was something that helped you coming from an engineering background to go into acquisition? Was that something you drew on? Um, yes, Anne, absolutely. I, and I still to this day find it's very important to have that, that engineering fundamental background that can help you to articulate issues that, as they arise 
or to understand the technical challenges. In some cases, when we put together programs, we've been known to try to stuff everything, all this new technology into one platform. And sometimes you have to take a step back and say, wait a minute, you know, are, are we setting ourselves up for failure or setting ourselves up for a huge program delay? So yes, I think it's very, it's been very helpful along the way to have that engineering background. Um, and I think it's helpful on the acquisition side as well. I think you'll also find that people coming from a logistics background and other backgrounds is what makes that acquisition team really function well, the business financial. You have to have it all to understand it. I think a team, an acquisition core of just engineers would not be a balanced core, but absolutely it's been tremendously helpful. Yay. Oh, yes, sir. And, and I'll just add to that, um, and Susan, I think I got the name of the new program right, but the, the new newly Commander's Development Program, which I'll eventually get the name right, but um, it's a tremendous feeder to my office. Um, we have two standing jobs within um, DAS and SHIPS that since the CDP was stood down and the new program isn't up yet, um, I've, I've continued that with Susan's help and having the PEOs feed um, folks that have had the opportunity to rotate through. And it's just been tremendous. I, I mean, I've since CDP and, and now even, I mean, the folks that come through, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for them and it's just great for, for my organization. And I'll put a plug in for Office of Secretary of Defense, Jack Evans' office also um, has rotational opportunities that have been standing long term. And the beauty about CDP was that you could, um, you could kind of map your own destiny. You didn't have to go to a job that was a standing rotation. Um, so uh, I highly encourage any kind of developmental program like that or, or a rotational opportunity that they do pop up. So, yes ma'am. I have a question for you. Do you miss actually working with the equipment? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, when you're in the Pentagon, um, you're in, you're, you're there it feels like 24 seven and a lot of times you don't get out to get to see the product as much as you want to and you should. So those are the treats. Those are the rare treats that, you know, when I get a day out and I'm able to go and walk a ship or go visit, you know, a production line, missile production line or a radar house. It's absolutely being able to touch the product is, is phenomenal. Glenn. Oh. Vacation, yeah, no, <laughs> that's exactly right. Oh, there have been there have been a lot of them. I, I guess I'll give you. I don't know why this jumped into my head, but I'll give it to you. Um, when I first came into the job, I'd probably been in the, in the Dazzin job about two years, and um, there was a lot of interest in Congress, especially on the House side, about shipbuilding and wanting to understand and the, the belief that 
the foreign yards were better than than our shipyards. And so I had the opportunity to travel with congressional delegation to visit yards in Europe, and then a separate trip we went to visit yards in Asia. And you know, the whole time you're trying to educate them, and finally I got them to go to visit the U.S. yards after we did all that. And it was so refreshing to be, we were in a yard in uh, Japan, and they built commercial ships, but they also built military ships. And so they, t they wouldn't let us go on the, sh the military ship, but they took us where they were building, and there was barbed wire all around this area. And, you know, I remarked, well, why do you have barbed wire all around? Well, we don't let the workers in here touch those ships, the commercial ships. And when we got back into the conference room, I said, well, what's your contract value for the ship, the warship you're building, which is smaller than a DDG-51, but it was close enough. So with all the conversion rate, it was about a billion-dollar contract. So, which was comparable to, at the time, our destroyer. So it was kind of one of those, see, told you, uh, <laughs> moments for me, <laughs> which I didn't try to rub in. But I did use in testimony. I could say, do you remember when we traveled? So that was very handy testimony. So I, I would say that was one of the rewarding parts of it, to be able to interface very closely with members of Congress and try to educate them on what we do, what our yards do, um, and the products that we bring to our men and women. That's probably not the most favorite because those are some tough trips, but but overall they're very rewarding. So, Kelly. Can you give us an example of when you might have been mentored or served as a mentor and you probably a successful relationship and why that was so? Okay. Um, I'll put a plug in for Paul Schneider, probably who one of the best mentors that's ever been. And I would tell you Paul probably was would not say he was formerly my mentor. But um, I, I always felt, looking at Paul, he had, he had the big picture. I called it the big chessboard. He kind of knew where everybody was, what they were doing, what their strengths were, what their talents were. And when an opportunity to, would arise, he would call and say, hey, have you thought about this? Um, and you might not have. And I was always so, thought that was very powerful. So, you know, I'm, I know a lot of us have always thought he had a gift, and I believe he does have a gift for that. Um, that we try to strive to do the same thing. We all think about folks that have come come through or that I've you know been along the way and say, when I hear opportunities, uh, Ann and I have had the opportunity to sit on many slating panels at NAVC for, for example, for deputy program manager and program manager jobs. And in fact, one several years ago, we looked at the camp, we very few applicants, and quite frankly, none of them quite fit. And so we sat and brainstormed and reached out to other people and we ended up with a PM that's just done a stellar, stellar job. So I think to me a mentor is to always in the back of your head know people's strengths, know where they need to fill in their resumes and be able to give them that kind of guidance. Does that help? One last Clark? question over here. Okay, Clark. Allison, uh, throughout your Red tie, by the way. Within the Navy, the uh, roles, responsibilities, and, and how women had opportunities. Um, have you seen changes? Oh yeah. And what what should we look for in the future? Well, I think some areas now that are comfortable. There's some that may be uncomfortable. And where where should uh, people look? Um, I do, I have seen change. I mean, I, I, Robin made the, the joke in the very beginning about the line in the ladies' room. That's not a joke. Real, I mean, it's, I think that's <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Um, I, I remember when I first came into the job and there was a Saturday meeting with Admiral Clark, who was CNO at the time, and we were in the big 40, 447, the big conference room, and, you know, we took a break, and, oh, no line in the ladies' room. And, and that's because I think there were two two SES civilians there and one one woman flag. And I think that's probably the area I've seen the most change is in the flag officer corps, in the, in the uniform side. There's so many more women now uh, in senior positions than there were. Um, so, and, and I think that's a good thing. I think, I think it's good to bring the different ideas to the table. I don't think there are any areas yet that are gonna be, I mean, submarines, but we're breaking that. Um, 
I, I don't think that there are any areas that, that are not open for people, and I think, you know, ought to take advantage of every opportunity that presents themselves. So. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the track. <laughs>